Welcome to the TED interview. I'm Chris Anderson, and this is the podcast series where I sit down with a TED speaker, and we get to dive much deeper into their ideas than was possible during their TED talk. Today, my guest is Melody Hobson, a business leader and innovator. And we're going to attempt to have a conversation about something that some of us might find just a bit uncomfortable. It's a conversation about race. I'm a white guy, and most of the white people I know are progressive souls who recognize the centuries of injustice in many parts of the world. They loathe racism. They do not view themselves as racist in any way. In fact, they crave a world where these issues would go away where we can just look at each other, one person to another. That desire for a person's race to become invisible, you can call that color blindness. Color blindness might seem to be built on good intentions, but Melody argues that color blindness is dangerous. I think it's time for us to be comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation about race. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, male, female, all of us, If we truly believe in equal rights and equal opportunity in America, I think we have to have real conversations about this issue. We cannot afford to be colorblind. We have to be color brave. Melody has built an extraordinarily impressive career in business. Today, she's the president of Aerial Investments, a company that manages funds worth more than $10 billion dollars. And she sits on the board of several major American companies, including Estee Lauder and Starbucks. Five years ago, she married movie director George Lucas and became a sought-after voice in Hollywood. She has experienced so many tears of life and is therefore the perfect person to talk about how to be color brave in every arena of society. Melody, you're joining me from San Francisco. I'm so happy to get to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So I'd love to start with a little more about your background. Can you give us a picture of you as a child, like what it was like growing up? Well, I grew up the youngest of six kids, and I'm really young in my family. My oldest sister is more than two decades older than me, and I have one brother, four sisters and a brother. They were very fond of saying that I wasn't planned. They used to make jokes all the time about the fact that uh, they used to say that I was found on the doorstep. And, you know, they were when you have a sister who is 25 years older than you and you're five years old, you kind of believe them. And it was very funny. I mean, growing up, I joke with people, I didn't have a chicken breast until I was like an adult. I thought wing was the chicken. Um, and so, you know, just when you're the youngest kid, you kind of get the last of everything. But it was a, a great family and a great life. And even though I was the baby of the family, I was very independent and self-sufficient. I was born focused. I mean, I really was. I was one of those kids who came out of the womb very much with a sense of of direction and very much of a sense of what I wanted to be. And a lot of it was based upon the fact that I didn't want to be poor, hmm. that we lived this life was that was very up and down. And sometimes we had an okay existence and sometimes we didn't. And we used to get evicted and our car used to get repossessed and our phone used to get disconnected. And we were literally that family that had the bounce check on the wall at the store. And um, because of that, I was desperate to understand money, which is why it's not an accident. I'm in the financial services industry. And it's probably not an accident that I had this search for truth and justice um, Mm. because of some of the inequality that I saw and lived. I mean, any specific stories of you as a kid that that might have fueled your sense of around the issue of race, racial injustice of some kind. Was that an issue you were deeply aware of growing up? I was deeply aware of it because my mother made me aware of it at a very young age. I grew up um, going to a school where there weren't a lot of black kids. And so my mother, from a very, very young age, just sensitized me to race. Rightly or wrongly, she just did. And she made it very clear to me that I wouldn't always be in situations where I would be welcome or where people would treat me well. I told the story in my TED Talk about going to a birthday party and coming back and her asking me, how did they treat me? Instead of asking me things that, as a kid, you would expect, like, did you have fun and how was the cake? My mother said, how did they treat you? I was seven years old. And I remember being really taken aback by the comment. And she looked at me with this sort of look that I'll never forget. And she said, they won't always treat you well. And that's, you know, cold water when you're a child. You don't understand what that means. 
And throughout my growing up, she made it clear so that when I had situations that were less than perfect, I wouldn't be shocked and amazed or thrown off my game, that I would be prepared mentally for, you know, for the the adversity. And that I'm grateful for. It may have been, you know, a bit early by some people's standards to start that conversation, but my mother was just practical and she didn't let allow us to have fantasies. I mean, she just didn't. I mean, right there in your childhood, you were almost being nudged away from being colorblind. Your your mother was specifically saying, you know, she might have ignored race, if you like, but she was making you pay attention to it. Would you encourage other mothers to do that? The issue matters too much to any child not to do that? It's fascinating you say that because I never thought of it that way. And I'm actually a bit overtaken with emotion with the thought, but she taught me to be color brave. That's right. She did. Because she didn't make race a conversation that was taboo. She put it right in front of me. And she uh, sensitized me to all the issues that would come from being first a Black girl and then a Black woman in America and in the world. And as I look back on that now, I have so much gratitude for her. That was really a gift that she gave me because it really armed me. It was like a superhero outfit that I put on to get ready for the day. And it wasn't because every moment of every day I was confronting something that was racially challenging, but certainly there were undercurrents and slights and things like that that I was attentive to because she helped me to see. I'm always amazed by both young women and people of color who are 25, 30 years old, and they'll say things like, I've never experienced any sexism. I've never experienced any racism. And I literally, I want to say to them, you just didn't see it. It was there. And that's not me being a negative Nelly. It's just the truth of the world that we live in. And my mother did not let me walk around with those, and I'll, you know, bring the pun all the way forward, blinders on. Mm. Well, this is such an important conversation, because I think there's definitely plenty of people out in the world who really want the comfort of colorblind, if you like. Like, they they don't believe themselves to be racist in any way, uh, but they're uncomfortable with the conversation. It's like, couldn't that all just go away? Didn't we win those battles two or three decades ago, can't we just get on and talk to each other as human beings? And um, you believe definitely that it's, you know, maybe at some point in the future that might be possible, but for now, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. And I mean, if anything, our present conversation, which has devolved from even my talk in 2014, is an indication of how desperately this country needs to understand what has happened. I can't Hmm. remember who told me this, but someone said to me, you know, America was born with a birth defect, and our Hmm. birth defect was slavery. And the one thing about a birth defect is you can live with it. It's something that is there that you can see. It's always there. And that's how I feel about this racial issue as it relates to our country. It's always there. And pretending that it isn't isn't going to make it go away. And if anything, pretending that it's not there, I think it it makes it worse. Mm. And so I think it's more critical now than even when I gave this TED Talk in 2014 that we just admit the issues that we have in this country and the problems that we have, again, not only in this country, but in this world around these issues, but distinctly um, around these issues in America, given our history. Mm. Well, there's so much in what you just said, and we're going to come back to it. But for now, I just want to go back to you as this black girl in a mainly white school who nonetheless shone. I mean, and shone partly from what you just said, just because of your, your focus, your determination to not be poor. And you shone so much that uh, it bought you a ticket to Princeton. What was that college experience like for you? I loved college. I loved Princeton. I mean, they joke that Princetonians bleed orange and black. I'm one of those people. And I think one of the reasons I did so well at Princeton is I'd gone to a school with mostly white kids my whole life. So there was not a lot of culture shock for me in transitioning to that environment. I felt like I belonged there. I felt like I had earned the right to be there, despite sometimes having people say things like I was an affirmative action baby. And, you know, I've had people say I took their kid's slot, you know, those kind of things, which are crazy. But I would say that every day that I was there, I I had this sense that um, I was given this real opportunity to learn and do something with it. And so I just took advantage of it. I really did. I loved it. I mean, I would go home early from Christmas vacation to go back to Princeton, 
which who does that? I did. <laughs> you know, I'd be on a basically empty campus. But I love being there. I mean, apart from anything else, it seems like there's a pretty intense work ethic somewhere in there. And uh, you carried that forward in as you uh, worked your way up Ariel, this in, in investment firm. I mean, that journey, so few African-American women have made that specific journey of, of, I think you started as an intern initially there, and then you found yourself a few years later president of this massive financial investment firm. How did you account for that? Was there something special or different in what you were doing? Did you just feel great good fortune? Well, certainly I had the opportunity to be an intern at Ariel, and I immediately knew that I was at a special place. The founder of our firm is a gentleman named John Rogers, and he was one of these people who changed my life. And he changed my life by telling me, like my mother did, that I could be or do anything. And the way John did it was he said the first day I went to work at the firm, he said, you know, Melody, you're going to be in rooms with people who have big titles and make a lot of money, but it doesn't mean their ideas are better than yours. I want to hear your ideas. He empowered me from the very first day. I was this pipsqueak who knew nothing about nothing, but he told me that he wanted to hear my ideas and I, I believed him. And so then I felt that I had a responsibility to show up and have ideas. And I worked really, really hard to learn and to hone what I would call creative thoughts. When I was at Princeton, I had this professor who used to joke with us when we were in our small precepts. If someone would say, you know, I want to reiterate what Chris said, he would say, you mean iterate again. And it was his way of telling us that we did not have an original idea. Hmm. And so when I went to work at Ariel, I was all about, I want original ideas. It may be years before I have something to say, but when I say it, I want to break through with, with nuance and originality, which is really, really hard to do. And John gave me the permission. He gave me the license to be able to do that, which was really great. I'd always worked really, really hard as a student. I mean, hard, just crazy. I used to lock myself in the bathroom in my house because there were no quiet rooms to work in. And um, when I went to to Princeton, because it was just a difficult school, you had to. I mean, you'd get a thousand pages of reading in a week. And it was just, you were always drinking from a fire hydrant. So I was predisposed to the work. And so when I got to Ariel, working hard was just normal for me. I also grew up with a mother who had this belief that you should never sleep past 6 a.m. on any day. And if you did, even on a weekend, she would say, you know, the world is passing you by. And she'd want you to look out the window and see how many lights were on and give you a sense of, you know, how many people were getting ahead while you were sleeping. And to this day, I still have that same sensitivity. I live in a high rise in Chicago and I check the lights to see how many lights are on when I'm waking up to see if, you know, are other people getting an edge? Could I be waking up earlier and doing more? And so I think, you know, there's a direct correlation between hard work and success in life. And the more you apply yourself, I think the more the good things come. Melody, um, you had the chance at Ariel to, to implement and build the kind of diverse organization that you've been articulating for and prove to yourself that it actually worked, that it could deliver greater performance. Well, we believe that intuitively, but we also believe it based upon the results that we have. We are a believer in Scott Page's work, the University of Michigan professor who wrote the book called The Difference. We had this core belief that diverse backgrounds and opinions lead to better outcomes. What we do in the investment business is inherently hard. We're buying stocks when they're out of favor, ignored, misunderstood, underfollowed. Some people say value investors like us catch falling knives. And so the one thing you want to do in, in order to make sure that you don't fall into what we call a value trap, where you have bought a stock that is cheap for a reason, is you want lots of countervailing views. And you want people to really challenge ideas. And you really want to avoid groupthink. The worst stocks we've ever had are names that we've bought where there wasn't disagreement. When there's disagreement, that dissonance leads to asking hard questions and leads to getting those answers and, in our view, leads to a better outcome. For us, diversity is a competitive advantage because we're so different than all of the other investment firms that are out there. Give me a sense as to how. How do you measure that? Well, certainly, if you look at the senior leadership of our firm, if you just look at our executive team, we have five people in our executive team. We have three women and two men. So of the three women, one is a black woman, me, one is a white woman, our CFO, Maureen Longoria, and one is an Indian woman, our chief investment officer of international and global, Rupal Bansali. So you have three women, 
two are what you would consider minority, black and Indian, and then a white woman. And then of the two men that we have on that five-person team, one is African-American male, John Rogers, who founded the firm, and one is a white male. I would argue that when you look at investment firms around the nation, I'd love to see that level of diversity where women actually have the majority in that situation. And despite a significant blip during the financial crisis, I mean, by many measures, Ariel has performed incredibly well. We believe so. I mean, certainly the financial crisis was a come-to-Jesus moment for our firm. 2008 was the worst year in the history of Ariel. But since that time, our recovery has been spectacular. We're in the top of our peer group. That is a testament to the work ethic, the energy, and the fact that this diverse approach and all these diverse people coming together to solve these hard problems leads to a positive outcome. So all of this really made you uniquely qualified to come to TED four years ago, and um, make this argument, not colorblind, be color brave. Explain the argument. So here's the argument. I just found myself in lots of meetings where people would, when any issue even remotely related to race would come up, and they would tell me they were colorblind, and they would say it so proudly. They say, I don't even see race. And I started to say to myself, okay, This is crazy because in not seeing race, they don't even see how much they're excluding. So this isn't me calling someone a racist. It's just saying not seeing race is not working. It's just not working for our society. So those people are holding on to that as a badge of honor. I want them to stop. I want them to actually purposefully see race. And as I say in my talk, I want them to observe their environment invite people into their world who don't look like them, who don't think like them, who don't act like them, who don't come from where they come from, in an effort to have a better, more inclusive society and to end the homogeneity that has existed in so many corners of our society. Some of us who live in major urban environments may not think that's true, but when you start going to the heights of corporate America, it goes white very, very fast in our country. And that means that we're not as good as we can be. So this is advice that you think applies to someone running any company or any organization, like an educational establishment, and even in people's private lives, you think some measure of this advice applies? I think it's about if you are on the PTA and you look around your PTA meeting and you see that all the people are alike, that's a problem. If you're in a hiring committee at work and you notice that the people that you're fielding for potential jobs are all the same, all the same background, that's a problem. If you are in your everyday life finding whoever you have lunch with looks like you, came from where you come from, holds the same views, I think that's a problem. And the reason why I say problem, we have a society that has been rocked by a level of intolerance that is just shocking. And this need to make people other, I think it leads to conflict and ultimately war. And so it's in our own best interest. At the corporate level, we could have better results. We could have insights on different kinds of customers. We could have the smartest people in the room working with us who are different because we didn't exclude anyone. It's in our best interest as a nation in terms of our vitality and ability to grow and to be hungry Mm. and the inclusiveness that America was built on. It's in our best interest as a world for us, us all to get together, get along well, because the stakes are very high when we don't given some of the means to which conflicts can escalate. There are probably a lot of people who do work in an environment that is largely white who would say, yes, you know, I am a bit uncomfortable with that. I have noticed that and I wish it wasn't that way. But here's the thing, you know, every time we try and recruit someone, we put out a job ad, 90% of the applicants are white and maybe 95% of the qualified applicants are white, and that we can't fix this problem that you're trying to fix without fixing a whole series of other problems to do with history, culture, education, training, and so forth. What would you say to those people? I reject that thesis. So I reject that thesis from a very basic standpoint. I'm going to start with the big picture, and then I'll get more granular. There are more than 300 million Americans. There's someone out there who can do the job, literally. So, I mean, let's just start with that fact. Then 
Let's go for being unconventional in the methods in which you seek to acquire talent. People have been doing that forever. People buy firms just to get talent. You know, that's very, very common in Silicon Valley. They'll buy a business just to get the best entrepreneurs in that organization, not even necessarily for the technology. You know, people get creative when they need to be. When something is urgent and really an imperative to your long-term success, both personally or that of your business, you will do what you need to do. And all I'm saying to people, this is an imperative. The world is changing in real time. And to not understand that, it has just dire implications for the long-term success of a company. I do not believe you can call a company a 21st century company today that is lacking diversity because they won't be able to survive long-term. They won't be able to understand the unique interests of their customers. They won't be able to relate to them, et cetera, as the browning of America continues. So you can have excuses about it, but we don't have excuses about anything else in business. If we had an earnings target and we don't make it, no one can make excuses about it. You did it or you didn't. As Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. And so on this issue, if you really believe it is a part of your long-term viability, both as an individual in terms of your own success or as a company, you got to try harder and find ways to network and source those opportunities with other people. You know, if I, it, let's just make this up. If I had to fill a certain position and the the resumes weren't coming back the right way, I'd be reaching out to various people in the community saying, how can you help me network with people in your community that may be right for this job? People love those calls. Mm. Helping a friend or someone else get a job, you know, you're, you've got a friend for life. Melody, um, if someone's persuaded by your argument about being color brave, but that they're not in a hiring position, they're just, you know, an ordinary person with a job and a social life, what advice do you have to them? How can they be color brave? Well, first, it starts with you. It's not, you know, others. It's what can you do? And so I always tell people, you could reach out to someone who's very different from you, circumstance, race, et cetera, and invite them to lunch at work. You know, seek those people out and say, you know, I don't really know you and I don't know a lot about you and I'd love to to have lunch with you. It would be a bold move that would take a lot of courage. But again, I'm I'm preaching bravery today. I think asking the question, you know, life is not often about confronting someone with statements. Questions are brilliant in getting across an idea. That's what I seek to do when I'm in boardrooms. I seek to ask questions. And when asking questions, you put people in a position of having to respond or at least to think. And so even if it's not work, if you're not in that hiring position, you might say, listen, I've noticed, wow, we're attracting the same kind of people over and over again. What we, can we do to, to expand the opportunities? You can do it in a way that's not confrontational and just wanting the best for the team and for the company. People, you know, people always ask, who, who are your mentors? And I always tell them some of my best mentors I never met and they were dead. And I've been mentored in my mind by Martin Luther King, and I've been mentored by Gandhi, and I've been mentored by Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela and so many people because I read about them. And so diversity could even be that. What do you read to expand your knowledge and understanding of people and things? So how does your term color brave, how does that relate to affirmative action? I'm a believer in affirmative action. I'm sure in my lifetime I have benefited from it. I think the world is better for me having benefited from it. I know I certainly am better. I think affirmative action is, in certain situations, very necessary if we're going to have any opportunity of my words catching up. Because when you see the numbers over and over again, I love that line, math has no opinion. Just count. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who was at on the board of one of the major university law schools in the United States, and he had this conversation with me. He said, you know, Melody, we don't want to go to lowest common denominator. And I said, you know, that's a really interesting point. And, you know, he thought that I would say, like, you know, I agree with you and this, that, and the other. And I'm going to say this in a way that I hope comes across correctly, and I, it is a nuanced comment that may sound extraordinarily inflammatory, and I don't mean it to be, but it assumes that every single person in every university and every law school and every college is exemplary. 
And there are people who are mediocre. They just are. And that's not about race or anything like that. And there's a bunch of mediocre white people in some of these institutions. And so this idea that somehow if a a Black student has different standards or different scores or whatever it is, that somehow it takes the whole institution down, I just, I, 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 I don't agree. There is this um, controversy that affirmative action pushed too far in an education context can and has in some cases set people up to fail. You know, that the very strong STEM candidate going into a top engineering school ends up in the bottom 10% when they could have been a star in a slightly different school. That's if the star part is the most important thing. So we know in America, certain schools in and of themselves, just the brand is a door opener. And so if you tell me that the black or Hispanic kid is going to be, I'm making this up, in the bottom 10% at Stanford, fine. Versus being in the top 10% at, you name the other school, fine. I think that if I'm in law school and I've got a black kid in my law school who grew up in an inner city and we're talking about criminal justice reform, they may bring something else to the party than a school that has no black kids in it. So that's Mm -hmm. just my strong point of view. When it comes to corporate America, I want to be very clear. I do not think that you have to settle. I don't think you have to take the the person who is less capable or less uh, talented in order to check a box. I think that those people are out there. On top of that, it presumes that every single person inside of the organization already is top, top drawer. And the thing is, in real life, that just isn't true. It just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who contribute different things to companies. You know, at Ariel, we have people who are just wonderful teammates that you, if you were in in a foxhole, you'd want them there just for moral support. And there are people who are the smartest people you ever met. And there are people who are great problem solvers. And there are people who are really great with people. You know, they're, they're all of those things go into, again, the mosaic of our organization. You know, mm. I've been with people who are the smartest people in the room and you get them together and you have like an asshole convention. You know what I mean? Like where it's not fun. <laughs> so, you know, that's not, that's not the criteria for I've everything. I've been to those. I've been to those myself. <laughs> um, Melody, can I, can I tell you a story about a piece of impact from your talk? I suspect there are thousands and thousands of these stories out there. So I'm in the audience listening to your talk, and um, I have always seen myself as a global soul. I grew up in India and went to school in a school with kids from 30 countries and um, was very passionate about the notion of, I would say, colorblindness. Like that was my sort of dream of where the world would go, is that we would all relate to each other as human to human. And... um, you know, dreamed of a world where all these barriers between countries and races and so forth would would come down. And yet, I'm sitting there listening to you and thinking, look at my own friendship circle, mostly white friends. Look at the leadership team at TED, mostly white. You know, TED believes in racial equality, in the journey towards greater equity, etc. And yet, you know, we weren't delivering in the way that you were challenging us to. And so that little talk became a a bug in my head and in the heads of other people in the org. And um, it influenced us and and it impacted how we started to hire. It impacted how we promoted people. And um, gosh, something like a year ago, I was at a TED Women conference and I met this woman. She was African-American. She was the head of HR at an architecture firm in LA. And um, we had just started recruiting for a new head of HR. I was excited at the possibility that she might apply and come through our search process. So I encouraged her to do this, and she was up for it. And yet seeing what happened next sort of showed me just how hard a battle this is. Because, you know, when you, when you hire an outside search firm, They have a whole process. They have a whole list of checkboxes that they're going for. They're looking for someone with huge experience in the media industry, for example, or in the tech industry or in the nonprofit industry. And um, most of the people who check all their boxes were white. And in their whole process, they didn't even put her through it into the shortlist. We insisted that she come through. Um, your, Your talk 
persuaded us to take the leap and to be a little bit brave. Um, this woman, Rachel Morris, came and joined us a couple months ago, and it's been the most thrilling and spectacular hire I can remember making. She's already adding fire and um, challenges at every level, and I, I've never felt prouder of the leadership team that we have. I'm so excited about that story. I'm welling up a little bit. Um, you know, that's the way it should be. And the thing is that a lot of us don't even get a chance to come out of the gate. We just don't fit the image. You know, it's one of the things that I wrote about or say in the end of my TED Talk. I say, I want it to be a world where when a kid sees a business executive or a CEO in the paper or on TV, I want them to say, I can be like her. He looks just like me. And when a child in L.A. or Houston or Harlem or the south side of Chicago takes their bus at school, I want them to look out the window and believe that she can be anything. She can reach any height, that she can be welcome in any boardroom, lead any company. That was why I gave the other example. I said, you know, when you look at boardrooms in America and the number of boardrooms that are still all white male, which is where all the power is. I know I sit on boards. It's where the power is. And I said, imagine if I showed you the board of ExxonMobil and every single person on that board was black, you would say, what is up with that? But we don't even have that reaction when we see all white male anything. It just seems normal to us, despite a society that is increasingly, as I suggested, brown. So I think now the question is, what do we all do about it? You know, I love that quote that says, do what you can where you are with what you got. And so it's the idea that you can't wait. You know, you can't wait till you have more money. You can't wait till you have more time. You can't wait until you have more influence. You do what you can where you are with what you have. Can I ask, let me ask you this. I would love your take on where you think America is in terms of race relations, if you could draw a graph of progress, if you like, in, in race relations, starting from 1960, say, to the present, what, what would that graph look like? I see it as an upward trajectory. And for as disappointed and at times discouraged as I am by some of the rhetoric that exists today, and it is bad, so please don't get me wrong, the reason that I say it's an upward trajectory, because I'm sitting here in a studio talking to you as the president of an investment firm who sits on the board of J.P. Morgan Chase and Starbucks and Estee Lauder and who has had unbelievable opportunities, including attending one of the best universities in the world, who is married to one of the most successful iconic filmmakers in the world. I mean, this wouldn't be possible if it weren't for progress. Mm -hmm. And even on my worst day, my worst day where I am so discouraged and sad, I know I'm not in a field picking cotton. And that is something that is important to remember. We've made progress. I know what Barack Obama meant to me when he became president of the United States. And I know that it probably had a giant, giant effect on little black kids who were like Melody sitting in their school buses when they were in second and third grade, looking at a black president instead of wondering if there ever would be one. Mm. So those things you can't take back. And that's progress. But that doesn't mean we don't have some steep mountains to climb. They're enormous. And those mountains belong to all of us. We all have a responsibility in the society to move us forward, all of us. You talked about how your mother um, helped you think about race. What would you advise a white mother today to say to her kids? I think white children need to understand their privilege. They have white skin privilege, and that is real. Um, a white teenage boy, of which when I started dating my husband, we had one in our family, had different privileges than a black teenage boy would have had in our community. And I would always tell Jet Lucas about that. I'd say, you know, you can walk around in a hoodie, but Corey, my driver, his son, who's the exact same age, couldn't walk around this neighborhood like you do. He would be arrested, pulled over, things would happen. And I just would let him know what the differences are so that he was aware. And that's not for him to be burdened by it. It's just to be aware and understand the unique things that he didn't have to worry about that we do. Mm -hmm. And so I think that white children should understand their white skin privilege, just like I have to teach my child about the unique and extraordinary privileges that she has. 
she has wealth. She has all sorts of things. And I am teaching her about them early so that she understands. Mm. Well, I, I hear you, you know, making the case that even though the conversation's uncomfortable, it's it's just one that we, we still have to have and will have to have for a long time. Um, you mentioned, you know, the deep, dark history of slavery and racial injustice in America. Talk more about that, about whether there is some level of recognition of that history that is essential to progress. You know, Brian Stevenson has built this extraordinary memorial because of his deep belief that until we fully understand that it's all part of the same story, we can't move forward. How, how would you, how do you think about this? Well, one, Brian is a hero. Um, about three or four weeks ago, I went down to see the lynching museum in Alabama on a Sunday because I felt it was really important for me to experience with my family. And it's a extraordinarily moving and stunningly beautiful at the same time place yeah, it is. that packs a punch. And so um, I think Brian has a vision and it's a vision that is super important for our society. And I have learned a lot from him on that. He told me about how he went to Berlin and in Germany, they have all of these markers for things that have happened that did happen during the Holocaust as a way of never forgetting. And he feels that in America, we don't have any markers. And so that's where the museum, that was the the genesis of the idea for that, that we have to mark this injustice so we remember these lives and this, this loss. How, how might this play out, though? So let's say that lots of people, you know, go to the memorial and through other means, you know, there is a sort of a deeper understanding of that past and how it connects to some of the current injustices, especially in the criminal justice system. How does that turn into something constructive as opposed to, as uh, perhaps some people would worry, it just sort of stokes up old uh, resentments and increases stress? Can you picture some kind of moment of, of healing, of forgiveness, of reparation, of acknowledgement? In what form could it possibly take? It's interesting because when I went to visit the memorial, I didn't feel stress and I didn't feel resentment and I didn't feel, I felt I was visiting a sacred place and I felt a deep sense of sadness and loss. While it's a very difficult experience, I was really grateful to have it so that I could remember all the people who had sacrificed for me. And so what I would say is ignoring pain and anguish doesn't help you. It just doesn't. I think the best thing you can do is to understand the nuance. Racial inequality is wrong. That's not so hard. It just isn't. Mm. And when it is there, it creates really bad outcomes. And those bad outcomes, obviously, in this situation were people being lynched, but it had bigger effects in terms of the loss of those individuals and families and incomes and and all sorts of other wounds that we can't even imagine. Mm. And so I think that's important and healthy and not creating dissonance. I think it's creating healing and hope. Mm. How, how are we to think about this? There, there are a lot of people, I guess white people mostly in America and elsewhere in the world, actually, who are frightened to have conversations about race in any way. There are so many things that you can get wrong. You know, you can culturally appropriate something or you can use a term that has become slightly taboo or you can, you know, just put your foot in it and, and come over as an ignorant, innately racist person. And so people withdraw from it. You know, how do we, how do we facilitate a conversation without those buttons being pressed and one that is constructive? I can't assure you that the buttons won't be pressed, but I can say that this is why I distinctly use the word brave, that you actually have to have the courage. Courage is not being fearless. It's acting in the face of fear. And so the fear around some of these conversations and not getting it right are very real. These are difficult discussions. I'd be the first to acknowledge that. And they're laden with emotion. So I do understand that. Even in this conversation, I've had moments of great emotion just talking to you about certain things. 
Melody, I've been fearful of that, of that very fact. And so it's, I mean, it's hard, it's a hard conversation for me. You know, I could hear that some of the things I said, you, you, you know, it sounded like you were offended by some things. It's, it's, it, it is hard. No, I, I, if I, if I came across as being offended, maybe that's just human being and just the nature of, you know, may, I don't know, maybe I don't have a poker voice, I'll call it, since it's not a face that you're looking at. Um, it certainly wasn't that, but maybe it also is being strong in a point of view, you know, that that I feel strongly about what I believe. This is my truth. There are truths that are that can be different for people around some of these issues. I do want to make sure I respect that. And that's why I said I want to invite those other opinions into my life in order to be able to understand them and to be able to ask questions. And it, it, it goes both ways. Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing about that I didn't say in my TED Talk that I wanted to say is, you know, when you're Black in America, and oftentimes when we are Black in America in certain parts of our society, we know a lot more about white people than they know about us. A lot more. Hmm. And so how can we turn the tables in that conversation in a way that that people can know more about us and our unique issues and backgrounds, et cetera? My daughter speaks fluent Mandarin. She's five years old. And we've had a Chinese teacher who basically, you know, practically lives with us in making sure that she is, you know, really uh, grasp the language. And the one great thing about that is I tell people, my daughter, when she was maybe two or three, my husband said to her, her name is Everest. He said, Everest is black and white. That's to tell you we were teaching her about race. He says, Baba, which we call him, which is dad in Chinese, Baba is white and Mama is black. Everest is black and white. And she looked at him and she says, and Mandarin. <laughs> and we laugh so hard because she really does think she's partly Chinese or did for a long time. She did go through a phase the other day where she came home and told us she was Indian <sighs> because she's brown, and we tried to explain to her that she really wasn't Indian, but she's convinced that she's Indian, so for now she's also Indian, which is fine. But it's the idea that when in in having this child, you know, speak Mandarin, it really did overlay the whole Chinese culture into our life, and that's been the most amazing thing. And so I get to ask questions all the time of Lele. I'm sure I've gotten some things wrong or stepped in it and not been perfect, but it does come from a place of wanting to understand. And I know Mm. when I've engaged with people who are of different races around issues like that conversation I told you about the person who said, I don't want to go lowest common denominator at the law school where they were on the board, I'm couching my words when I'm trying to say, okay, all right, you're saying there might be a couple of mediocre black kids. You're assuming there are no mediocre white kids in the whole school. Mm. You know, that's what I'm saying back, really. And that's probably not politically correct or, you know. (laughs) Part of me wishes we could all have a giant social contract with each other that just says, let's make this trade-off. Let's agree to allow ourselves to be just a little bit offended in exchange for being more open with each other and, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. That, That's why I made that statement. Yeah. If we would, if we had benefit and no doubt, I'm willing to make that trade all day long. Mm-hmm. I've been in situations where people have said things where I'm like, "Let me tell you why you don't want to say that." <laughs> <laughs> you know, like let me let me just tell you why that doesn't work. You know, in our community, you know, and there are so many funny examples I can tell you. You know, one of my best friends who is not black. She's not black has twin boys, and she always calls her little boys little monkeys because they're always jumping around, (laughs) you know, everywhere. And she always, always, always calls them that. She's white. She's from Israel. She's dear to us and to me. And I look at her, I'm like, never call a black kid a monkey. (laughs) I'm like, like, never do that. Bad idea. Just making sure you know. And she was like, well, they, you know, little kids jump all around. My little boys are these toddlers and they're always jumping. I'm like, just don't ever make that mistake. And that wasn't from a place of, you know, being offended. I was just like, note to self, you know, you probably want to know this. Doesn't translate. (laughs) Well, I think one of your great gifts for the world, Melody, is is your ability to to give that kind of advice and much more in a way that many people can hear and not go into immediate defensive mode. Not everyone can do that. And I, and I, I really do think it's, uh, it's a huge gift. I want to, just on, on, on your, your statement about, you know, there's, there's my truth and your truth, the philosopher in me would love to push back on, on that because I, for me, truth is the core value. You know, without there being one truth, that there's no chance of people converging 
I'm using that truth. I'm using it in a different way, so I should clarify this. I'm not talking about facts, disputing facts. I'm not. I'm talking about truth from the perspective of experience, and so that's what I'm saying. Like there are experiences that I have had that are true to me that you wouldn't ever be able to know or understand, and so I give you the benefit of the doubt because you couldn't understand them. I am married to someone who is not black, mm. and all the time I've desensitized him to issues around race. Mm. And that's not because he doesn't care. I know he loves me, but I know that there are times that I have to provide a lens for him with which to see or experience things as I am experiencing them. And that does not in any way diminish my love or respect for him. It just says, what in his experience would have this be possible that he could see this right. and how it's playing out from the eyes to which I see it? When I walk into a room, I can notice not because I'm counting, I can just feel when it's just me. Mm. I can tell you, George doesn't, until you know a few years ago, he never thought about that. Mm. Now we'll go certain places, he was like, you're the only black person. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, it's interesting you notice that now. <laughs> because why would he have noticed before? Can you talk a little more about, about your relationship with George Lucas and how that has worked out? I mean, you two are an astonishing duo. Is there a sense in which one plus one equals more than two? Well, there's no question. There's a lot of good things that come out of the combination. And it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals 10. We've been able to enrich each other's lives and recognize the platforms that we have in our individual ways and help magnify them give each other different perspectives and a different lens in which to operate. And that has been a gift. So I think for as much as George has affected me, which is profoundly, um, I have also affected him. He sees injustice, and but he always saw that. You know, he's a, he's, he's a fighter in his own unique way. His stories suggest that. I think you, you were quoted once as saying um, that in a sense you were the same person. What, what did you mean by that? We are. George says that. We share a core value. When we got married, Bill Moyers was the officiant at our our marriage. And he says, you know, when you fall in love, you meet your mind's friend. Hmm. And I met my mind's friend. You know, I met this person who so clearly reflected so many of my values, but who came in a different package and a different age and a different race and a different life experience. Hmm. And all of that was enriching. So it wasn't a color brave moment because I was never, I, 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 I didn't need to make that leap emotionally or otherwise in terms of love. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any blinders on. I didn't have any, I didn't have any idea. You, you, I didn't limit myself to what was possible. Hmm. That really, I was more of like anything could happen. And in fact, anything did. That's what happened. <laughs> so for the long term, let me ask this. In the long term, is it okay to dream about colorblindness? And I mean this in the sense that, you know, it used to be thought that race was this hugely significant distinction among people, that, that um, people were almost different species because they were different colors. We now, um, most of us, believe that color of skin is really the least interesting thing about someone, that um, people's character, people's skills, people's dreams, people's hopes. These are the things that matter. So is it is it possible to dream of a future world where there actually is colorblindness, that people, that those, because, because the world has become juster, because there aren't groups who are unfairly left behind, for example, or mistreated or not, not included, that, that you can get to that kind of world and that ultimately in the long term that would be a better world? Wow, that's a really great question because I I do believe in playing long ball. At Ariel, we have a turtle as a logo and we say slow and steady wins the race. Um, here's my conundrum and I'm I'm you're hitting me cold and I'm trying to think out loud here. On the one hand, I learned this from Wenton Marsalis. I love this example he gives. I want to attribute when I learn things from people and not try to represent them as being my own. He talks about the fact that beyond skin when you get to cellular bones, all those things, our bodies are colorblind. And that's just like, once you get past the epidermis, you can't tell 
what someone's race is. So in reality, as human beings, that is true. On the other hand, when I listen to you, I think of that world that you're describing as being so far away from reality that I see that I don't want to give anyone the opportunity to not work hard today and to maybe fall into some belief that we're there. And so I say, it would be a dream, but it would be a dream that would be so distant mm -hmm. when you look at where we are right now. Look at the reaction to someone like Meghan Markle being in the royal family, where there was initially, there were a lot of horrible statements about her. And at the same time, I can tell you, I was in Chicago and I woke up at 4 a.m. to watch the wedding. And I wept watching it. Mm -hmm. And when my child woke up, because she wanted to see the princess, she wanted to see the princess. Remember, she's five. We're into princesses. And the first thing she said was, she looks just like me. Mm -hmm. I nearly fell out of my chair because it was actually true. You know, Meghan Markle is a mixed race person, as so is my child. And when she said that, I was like, you know, that was my school bus analogy. The child who looks out, looks mm -hmm. out and says, I can be that. I'm not saying that I want her to be a princess, but I want her to be anything she wants to be. And so in my heart of hearts, do I want that to be the society that she grows up in? But do I go back to my mother's reality, realism and her pragmatism? And I say, that's not life. And so do I tell her she's a black child? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do I try to prepare her for the world that she will encompass, encounter, even though she will encounter that world with tremendous resources and tremendous education and the two loving parents and all sorts of things that will give her an advantage over a lot of people. They say if you're born in America, Warren Buffett says you've won the birth lottery. Well, my child won the birth lottery in America. But at the same time, she still is Black. And that is real. Mm. Melody Hobson, I'd like to thank you again for your amazing TED Talk and for spending so much time with me here today. I really, really love how you speak about these issues. It's, um, you will get through to people who others won't get through to. So please don't stop what you're doing. Um, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This week's show was produced by Sharon Mashihi. Our associate producer is Kim Nadefane peterser Special thanks to Helen Walters. Our show is mixed by David Herman, and our theme music is by Alison Leighton Brown. In our next episode, I talk to Ray Kurzweil, an inventor who is famous for predicting the future of technology with an accuracy that's pretty uncanny. We'll dive deep into his latest vision of the future. We'll be able to express ourselves with more than one body. People will think it pretty primitive that, wow, and back in 2018, people only had one body and no backup, and they couldn't back up their mind file. That's next week on The TED Interview. Uh, before I go, I'd just love to say something quickly about why we're actually doing this. Now, not everyone knows it, but TED is actually a non-profit organization with a simple mission to spread ideas that matter. Normally we do that through short TED Talks, and this podcast series is an experiment at taking the extra time to go much deeper. So we'd love to know whether it's working for you. <laughs> do you like it? If so, we'd love you to share it with your friends and also to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. I read every single review and love knowing what you think. So thank you for listening and thanks for helping spread ideas. Ideas.